I'm about to tell you a story of three engineers, a DevOps application and data. All three of them have different needs and different views. And why can I tell you their story? Because I had the unique opportunity to play all three of them. Hello, my name is Leron Bivas, and I work for Iguazio. I'm a, what I tend to call myself a joker engineer. Uh, and as you can see, I'm really into Legos, but uh, this is as far as they go down this presentation. For, for the past decade or so, our big data world has changed dramatically. Since its first release back in April 2006, Hadoop really defined the big data era. These were the days network was slow, memory was expensive, and we needed something to, com to uh, process our ever-growing data. We believed that by bringing the compute closer to the data, we will solve all of our problems. We remodel our application into MapReduce pipeline, and it actually worked. And it was fairly easy to deploy these scenarios. Our big data world has grown. Our software needed a lot more than just MapReduce. Our users demand a lot more analytics. Memory became slightly cheaper, so we had the idea of loading everything into memory and try to compute it as much as possible in there. We worshiped the RDD that Spark brought us. We even started storing some of our data a non-Hadoop, NoSQL data source like Redis or Cassandra or maybe Elasticsearch. <coughs> but we need a lot more. We place Kafka or RabbitMQ right next to our APIs. Our application flow was reading in growing amount of data. We needed a method to process all those incoming events. We built uh, event process pipelines with spouts and bolts. We added Flink and even turned back to Spark and got uh, our notion of streaming with micro-batching. <coughs> Overall, all those frameworks were basically a way, <clears throat> a way of bringing more and more data into our big data world. Now that we were so good at collecting data, we need to figure out what it's mean. Uh, Presto was added to the mixture and with its querying solution. We turned to machine learning, later adopted uh, deep learning, and, and these days, uh, it seems like many companies want to add tensor flow to their ever-growing technology map. And deploying this infrastructure became real hard work. A lot of companies actually base their offering on how well they can actually deploy this, this, te te uh, this technology map into your organization. Even where I work at Iguazio, we provide Hadoop-compliant APIs because we deal with companies that require big data solution. The so-called cloud era didn't change much of what we knew. Uh, even the major cloud provider had some alignment with the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, major cloud provider have Hadoop integrated with their services. Most of them have an implementation of Hadoop compliant APIs. If we'll take, uh, uh, for example, we'll take Amazon, <coughs> the leading cloud provider. We have S3 uh, working as a Hadoop compliant uh, file system, EMR, which is elastic. Uh, Amazon Elastic MapReduce runs, of course, Spark, HBase, and Yarn. And later on, they added, of course, uh, other uh, capabilities we, we see. And of course, you, if you have TensorFlow, Amazon has a pre-configured AMI running for you uh, on AWS. And we started streaming stuff through Kinesis. But as you can see, nothing really changed. The hard work of actually deploying all of those tangled technology map re replaced by the, the actual wizardry of choosing which serverless uh, data service you're going to choose and trying to figure out what your invoice by the end of the month is going to be. And no one actually can. The cloud brought us to the serverless era. Our data was in the cloud. We didn't have to worry where it was. It was simply there or Occasionally, wasn't. Uh, and the, re the real major leap was the application-less code. This is when Lambda was introduced. Uh, we were promised a simple way to process incoming events uh, with just code. Well, if you're familiar with Lambda, this is the promise we got. We actually got something else. So let's do a short recap. 
Our data flow has obviously evolved. We added so many big data frameworks to our, to our toolbox. These frameworks were scheduled with different schedulers. Spark, for example, was using Yarn. Uh, some of them were using Mesos, and the application sometimes uses something completely else. <clears throat> and now, with the introduction of new architecture, new analytic tools, we need to rethink our ecosystem. Look at back at our three engineers, we need to re-understand re their current needs. Application engineers want, want, want what every application engineer wants. They want agile development. They want to release as frequent as possible and get the user feedback as soon as possible. Data engineers are pretty simple. They simply want stuff to keep working. They don't care how, but keep it working and have their data available. And the, data, and the DevOps engineers want their tools to keep work, the, 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 the tools to keep working, but have less maintenance. They want an easier way to manage all those services and application and frameworks, and they will not manage multiple uh, clusters with multiple scheduler. We, we must consolidate. Thanks to the container revolution, we have an easier way to deploy these scenarios, a new ecosystem to work with. Our combined toolbox will run on a single scheduler. And of course, since we are at KubeCon, I'm suggesting Kubernetes. So let's first review our data. Uh, we at the Guizer look at our data as unstructured object store, structured store, and streaming. This is basically how we look at our data throughout, even if it's cloud or even if you're on-prem. This is your data. Decoupling the data from our entire system requires a shift for in the current mindset. Our ecosystem should grow from a dupe mindset of distributing the data itself to distributing its access. When you run in the cloud, it allows you to access your data in a distributed fashion. Think of S3 or DynamoDB or Kinesis. You don't have to worry where the data is. You simply access it from anywhere. In, 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 and even if you don't run in the cloud, you can access your data using some services like LustreFS for objects. If you keep your data in Cassandra, you can access it without much problem, and your Kafka cluster can be accessed from anywhere. This is what people are actually referring to as cloud native. These are resilient and always accessible data services. In between, we have the orchestration. Kubernetes will schedule our application, analytics tools, our frameworks, and manage our entire configuration. When we align everything to a single unified orchestration, we need to adapt the application layer. We require the utmost layer to be upgraded. We can't simply run anything on top of our orchestrator. This framework and application must be cloud native. They have to use every tool Kubernetes has to offer. Besides our application big data frameworks, we can now leverage serverless frameworks. We can now have our function service, our very own Lambda. Our big data pipeline must evolve as well. And actually, it already has. It's no longer a pipeline. It's a living system. Our system and services are constantly processing and, analy and analyzing data, accessing the data simultaneously, running function, microservices, analytic tools. We have data coming in or pulled out from IoT devices, external sources, dashboard, and many more. The entire layer around our, our data runs on our unified orchestration. Data is being accessed from anywhere at any time. Another evolution we see when moving to Kubernetes is uh, using serverless frameworks, like I've mentioned before, the kubeless, OpenFast, Nucleo. Um, this is, of course, a blessed move. We now no, no longer need to worry how to uh, build Docker. We no longer need to understand how to deploy it, how to run it on Kubernetes. We simply write a code, and the function uh, frameworks will simply deploy it for us. It will compile us. The code and everything will simply run in, in, our, in our infrastructure. Another good benefit of function 
is basically you don't have to bind to any specific language. Your entire stack can, can, can be polyglot, and it already has. But using serverless frameworks uh, is the way, but comes with a great price. Usually it, it comes with a slow performance, sl slow development cycle, and we're mostly <coughs> limited to HTTP endpoints. Not really our, our very own Lambda. Look at all, and all those ser uh, serverless faults. We, the Guazio, decided to build a real-time real serverless pr uh, platform, Nucleo. Nucleo's platform can have any event source, not just HTTP. They can be, of course, combined. You can listen simultaneously to Kafka, to HTTP, to Kinesis, with the same function code that you wrote. This allows you a better debugging, testing, and execu execution cycle. Since we, all, we also run everywhere, not just Kubernetes, you can deploy and test everywhere. Your sole focus is, is on writing the code, and, and the rest is taken care of. We even provide you with built-in metrics uh, and logging. This was open source recently, and you should definitely check it out. We also provide, uh, now with a hackathon, we should definitely check it out. The, uh, the prize is a very iron uh, drone. So now we're probably saying, OK, I listened to your talk, and everything uh, containerized. I'm using function. I'm using microservices. My Spark is containerized, great. But now I have thousands of containers running on my orchestrator. And each one of them is going to open a connection to my data service. It's going to create a huge load on our system. And you're actually right. And when I said we need cloud-native frameworks and application, it meant that some frameworks need to evolve as well. At Iguazio, we are dealing with very large clusters and needed a way to optimize data access. We built a solution around shared memory, which brings the data directly to your application memory. The solution works closely with Kubernetes to allow shared connection, fast data access, and faster uh, connection initialization. Let's take, for, uh, for example, Spark. We created a data frame an implementation that reads from a shared memory populated by a V3O daemon running on each of the nodes. This daemon is the sole owner of the outgoing TCP or RDMA connection to the data service. Now, if you're not running with something natively that we support, like Nucleo, Spark, Hadoop, and others, we, can, we also have you this same solution available as a fuse mount which you can use a flex mount, a flex volume, to use in Kubernetes and read directly with your application. Now, just like with Nucleo, this entire work was open source, and you can check out the solution and work some ways how to actually leverage it with your data services. Uh, we do hope that other data services will, hope, will uh, offer such acceleration in the near future. We've talked a lot about how we need to look at our data, our application, our frameworks, which new frameworks we need to add. Now let's look at our deployments. Um, I'll assume the DevOps hat for a minute, but remember how hard it was to deploy and manage complete clusters? Let's look at the Spark example. Every aspect of the system is managed by Kubernetes. Deployment, services, and even the configuration itself. And config map is not just for flat configuration. Startup scripts are easily managed in config maps. And I, will, and I will later on demonstrate to you how I can leverage a lot of the tooling Kubernetes has to offer to manage your entire deployments. And how much simpler is using Helm versus Chef or Puppet? You don't have to use another language. YAML, which you have to use already 
because you're using Kubernetes, is being utilized by Helm to basically now describe your deployments. Another demo that I'll demonstrate is how a, uh, our, our current uh, pipeline looks like. And, uh, and like I said, a current pipeline is a living system. The data is simultaneously being accessed from multiple locations at once. So I'm taking a, a real example from one of our customers. This is an IoT automobile company. They have their cars sending uh, information constantly where the driver is, some metrics of the cars, and so on. And everything is being processed in real time and injected to our data services. And simultaneously, there are dashboards showing where the data, where the driver is, what are the alerts for that driver. And there are also data engineers trying to run analytics on the same data that just came in. Everything is being processed simultaneously. So let's jump into the demo. Okay, so what I have here is a completely new Kubernetes cluster running in, uh, in one of our data centers. I'll hope you, you can see it properly. So the first thing I'm, uh, I'm going to do is create a new namespace for, uh, for this new uh, customer. And since I can't show, I can't see what I'm typing. And of course, I'm going to make a mistake. Great. So we have a new namespace to facilitate this new customer. And now let's create something that allows that new customer to access its, uh, its new namespace. I'm going to do something that it's not something you should do. I'm going to provide it with the option to be a cluster admin. Usually we provide the option with the front grade uh, binding. But just for the sake of the demo, we create a new role binding. And now, we'll do Helm install of our VTR daemon. OK, so what I'm about to install in the namespace of KubeCon, uh, I'm using the V3AO daemon chart, which is available for you to use, and pointing to one of our data services. Once I hit, you immediately see that it's being deployed, and in a few seconds, it's operational. Now I want to show you what I, I meant when I used that config maps, not just config maps. It can do a lot more. Okay, I'm, I'm simply going to describe one of the config maps that I'm using. Can't see anything. Oh, wait a second. I forgot to update my context. Okay, so I'll move just so I can see as well. What we have here is raw configuration as a JSON file being saved directly as a config map. It's not the usual uh, way to use a config map because usually people tend to use it as a map, a key value. I simply place it as a file and then map it to the container. Another thing that I, I really love doing is the initialization script. I also place in a config map. It's allowed me to better control which, uh, which parameters I'm doing uh, initialization and not 
by overriding all kind of YAML files. Now let's add Spark. Again, like we did with the Vitreo daemon, it will simply run in a matter of seconds. Right? Very, very simple. Now, what I'm about to show you is Nucleo's uh, function service. <coughs> okay, we have, we have a, preg, a playground for you to actually deploy functions. It'll be simpler to find the mouse. I can deploy any preloaded function or, of course, provide with, me, with my own. Hit deploy, and it will simply ship to the, to the cloud. In this case, our Kubernetes cluster. But this is not how you usually want to do stuff. You don't want to open another IDE or another, another tool. You simply want to use either kubectl or other command line tools to do the automation for you. So, of course, we do have an automation tool for you, which is our And now I'm going to deploy a function, just like you see in, in the present in the UI. I'm going to deploy a function uh, using our new CTL command line tool. Okay. It will build, take the code, build it into a container, do all kind of tests for it, and ship it to a registry that we define, and it will be running in our Kubernetes cluster. Now, I also deploy uh, a UX, a UI for our demo, and While we're looking at that deploying, there's a simple map. Currently, there's no data because we didn't stream anything in. We just launched the application. Where, where there's a dashboard waiting for data to be streaming in. So let's stream in some data. Okay. It's, it's, it's just a streaming, but the real, real issue here is that you will con now the function that I recently deployed start to receive the events and populate all the real-time data on the map. This is, of course, uh, with a lot of drivers being hammered into the system, but as you can see, everything is constantly live during, during uh, the presentation. Now, now I have two, two, two ways of accessing the data. One is the function, the other is the dashboard, and I mentioned also that data engineers might wanna use, let's say, Zeppelin to run Spark jobs. So let's use Zeppelin, and we'll create a simple a second. Let's call it KubeCon. And now we'll do a simple Spark job just to, just to show you how I can access the data simultaneously as, it, as it's coming in from the function. OK, 
Okay, I have a, a very, very simple job. Run some analytics and show the results. This, of course, a call stars of Spark, so it might take a few more uh, seconds. But still, the data is coming in. It's being constantly processed by the function, constantly being read by the dashboard, and also by Spark job. This is what I meant, a living system. Everything is constantly being accessed. And we have the, out, the output of a single driver that fits the, the criteria. <coughs> now, during the talk, I said it's going to be easier to run with Kubernetes. We have a much easier deployment. And no one actually stopped me and said, this is not easier. You actually keep running kubectl, and you're using new CTL. And you're still editing YAMLs and init scripts, anything uh, and stuff like that. And too bad no one interrupted. But actually, yeah, this is not the way to do it. This is not the way to deploy. This is mimicking the old way of doing bad stuff on your deployments. So what you should be doing, let's kill the current application. I'll use Helm to, to kill everything. OK, I'm simply going to remove Spark, our daemon, the function, everything that we just installed. And I'm about to show you how to really do it, if it's working. So when I say that we should leverage our tools in, the, in our toolbox, Helm is not just for presenting how easy to install with Helm. It's how to install a complete application with the Helm. So as the, as the cluster is shutting down, what I'm, I'm about to show is that Nucleo provides you with a YAML. A YAML is something that is common to Kubernetes. This is a, a native YAML to Kubernetes, meaning you can edit it and redeploy the function over and over again through your functions. So taking some time, but meaning that you can take that YAML and use it in Helm using uh, um, all the templates in that Helm provide. And now you can launch everything with a single, a single command instead of all the stuff that I just typed in, which is I have to stress out, it, this is the wrong way of using Kubernetes, OK? I hope no one took pictures, but uh, this is actually the wrong way of using it. So now let's, let's see if it's, the demon doesn't want to die. We'll kill it. OK, so we, we have a clean cluster. And now this is the way to do everything that I just mentioned, including the, the role binding, including everything that I just mentioned, namespacing and everything, in a single command. This is the proper way. This is something that if you've been around the talks of Helm and uh, how to use Kubernetes, in a single command, we're going to deploy our function, our daemon, uh, Spark, Zeppelin, everything that I just showed you in like five minutes of work. Now is a five second of work until everything is running, including the new function, including Spark, including Zeppelin, and our enhanced daemon.
So, few tips and lessons learned we, we at the Guazio had along the way. The first and foremost rule, and I can't stress how important it is, is should really read the manual. And I'm neglecting the F, but you should definitely read the manual. I've seen too many hacks people are trying to do with Kubernetes, and, and the manual is very comprehensive, very easy to follow. It's, it's sometimes hard to follow because it's length, but it's not something that you say, oh, it's very, very difficult. Simply do a copy-paste of commands a lot of the times. Second is the community. Kubernetes has a great community. It's not limited to just GitHub. You can find the Slack channel. You can find the groups. Everything within the community is helpful. But it's come with a special note. Like Kubernetes, the community is young. So sometimes you might get help that's going to con contradict the, the, the manual. Try to recheck everything that you're getting help to. Know the tools that Kubernetes has to provide. Uh, during the development of many uh, scenarios for our customers, you don't know how, my, how, my, how many times I use port forwarding just to check if the pods is doing what I expect it to do. Do logging, collect everything that you have using kubectl. Kubectl is a great tool. You should really understand every other option that it has available. Also, one of the faults that most people are having in kubectl is when or not to use the minus O, the output. Because the output of YAML allows you a lot of times to understand what happened to the service or what happened to the deployment, and not all commands accept the minus O flag. And like I showed you, always navigate with Helm or other solution that you choose with, but stick to it. Helm has great, uh, great options, great, uh, great understanding of Kubernetes. And as you can see, once you really understand how to use it, our entire application stack was be has been deployed with a single Helm command. And doing upgrade with Helm is even easier. And like I uh, think that Kelsey mentioned, don't ever do kubectl edit. Don't ever do SSH into uh, or kubectl ex exec to edit your uh, containers. Simply use Helm. Another tip that we, when you deal with large cluster and many applications sharing uh, the same cluster, is do not you overuse the node port. Node port is great when we are doing debugging. It truly is great because you now know where to access. But if you stick with static node, node ports, it's meaning that you start having to manage all those node ports. Use load balancers. There are great options within Kubernetes. Now, the sixth item might look trivial, but configuration must go in config maps. Don't try to force them in into all kind of solution that I've seen is loading files from the host path, but someone has to populate that file, which everything goes to config map, which is very, very easy. And a specific case to a config map is dealing with YAML. YAML is very, very tricky uh, syntax. So when you try to override the command, you sometimes end up with results that you didn't expect. So like I've showed you, place in its script and call them instead of trying to do some wizardy with YAML. And the last, it's not really related just for Kubernetes. For any deployment, large clusters, you should really collect operational data and not just collect it. If you just collect it, you've done nothing with it. It doesn't mean anything. You can simply shut it down. You have to collect it. You have to understand it. We are big data engineers, so we need to understand what big data means. And if the data is meaningless, shut it down. Thank you. If you have any questions.